Welcome to the West End Church of Christ. We are conveniently located at 4401 West Broadway. We have ample parking around the building as well as a parking lot that's located adjacent to the building. Our regular order of service is Sunday morning at 10 a.m. we have Bible study. Afterwards at 11 a.m. we have our morning worship. At 5 p.m. on Sundays we have our Sunday evening worship. We do have midweek Bible study Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and we have classes for all ages. At the Western Church of Christ we also offer a radio program called More Bible Talk. It is broadcasted from WLLV, that's 1240 AM on the radio dial, and 101.9 on the FM dial. The dates and times of the classes are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 2 to 2.30 p.m. We also have a website. It is www.westncoc.com. On this website, you can retrieve lessons brought from the pulpit. Thank you very much. Let us stand, please. See number 346. 346. <coughs> Three hundred forty-six. <clears throat> Time is filled with the transition. No, no work of who shall stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to His hand. To God's unchanging hand.
<laughs> it's so good out of, out of 40 people, 40 so, that you hear that one voice, and it's like, ah, oh, I know that voice. I'm not gonna call any names of who that voice was I'm talking about, but I, I really, I, let's just sing that, that chorus one more time. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen. Amen. I let that person know once it's all said and done who I was talking about and how good it was to hear them singing as they were singing. But on this evening, again, I appreciate that we only had a few uh, to partake of the Lord's Supper on this evening. Uh, gives us time to get through our lesson, Godly Families. We're not trying to get home to watch any games on this evening, are we? <laughs> yeah. They play playing hockey on that field today or whatever they were playing. That's, that's not the field. That's okay. This will be all right. But anyway, she was just messing with me. She ain't in no hurry to get home. <laughs> Godly families. Godly families. Let, let me define a word for you as we get into this lesson. Godly families. The wisdom. Wisdom is a capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective. Wisdom as a process of submitting to God and authorities like fathers, mothers, lady wisdom, and then practicing their instruction in order to be wise. And then those are the two great definitions of wisdom. And what Brother Glenn read there, in, in, in accordance to wisdom, that we need to hold on to the things that are right. Not going down the wrong path, the path in which many people will try to persuade us to go down, but understanding what God wants us to do. Amen. You know, wisdom belongs to God's people. You know, I, I love how Solomon states in accordance to wisdom, and all you're getting, get an understanding. Get an understanding. You know, we do many things in, in many different ways, and we, we really don't understand why we're doing those things. And, and a lot of times it's not to be questioned, we are just to do them. Sometimes we need an answer. We want to know why. You know, that, that's one of the, I guess, the, the most worldly or now whatever that word is I'm looking for across the globe question that's always asked why why somebody want to know why and the answer is because I said so and we don't question God we just do what he tells us to do Amen. or shall I say we should do what he tells us to do Amen. but he gives us answers Every answer that he, he wants us to know, he's given it to us. Well, we read that he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You want to know the answer to life? Look in his word. Let me give it to you real quick. It's to fear God and to keep his commandments. That's why we're here. To fear him and to keep his commandments. To, to submit unto him. Godly families. I mentioned this morning about people wanting to be part of certain families because they're getting certain things. Here's the greatest family that everybody should want to be a part of, and that's God's family, because he provides everything for his people. That's right. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. No better family to be a part of than God's family. But we're talking about godly families. A family that's a part of God, family, and families that do what he tells them to do according to his will. We're going to look and we're going to talk about some godly families here. The oldest institution that has been ordained 
his family, the oldest institution. We know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We also know that he created man and woman. That's the first family. Man, man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. I had a young man say one day, this is my family. And I was quick to tell him, no, that's not your family. That, that child that belongs to this woman, that's your child, but this is not your wife. You, you haven't made her an honest woman. You, have not, you not, have not married her in the eyes of God. So she is not your family, but that child is yours. See, we have to understand what family is all about, what God has ordained as a family. Amen. In Proverbs 2, I mean, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 2, going back to the very beginning, looking at what family is according to God and not to man. Genesis 2, verse 18. Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But Adam, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And that rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to him. Then man said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his mother or his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is from the very beginning. That the family that God created, it was not two men, it was not two women, it was a man and a woman. Man. Many times when marriage, marriage ceremonies are being performed, they will say, now I pronounce you man and wife. And, and the wife gets mad and say, why you didn't say husband and wife? And so I, I, I try to keep that in mind as I perform a ceremony and say husband and wife. You should not have to pronounce them man and woman because that's who God ordained to be married was a man and a woman. Now they become husband and wife. Mm -hmm. That's the, the first definition of a family, man and woman. Not two men. They, they've changed it now to, to suit the ways of, of society because they are now partners. Two, two, two fathers in a home or two mothers in a home. Yes, most definitely. We have to stick with God's word man, and understand what God has said. Man. Godly family. A man that loves his wife or a wife that loves a woman that loves her husband. That's what a family is. Yes, you're going to have your ups and you're going to have your downs, but that should not cause you to want to get a divorce. So we look at these things and, and then we go to, to Proverbs 2. And we understand God's direction for the home. He directs the home. You know, it takes a wise person to understand what he or she needs to do in order to be pleasing unto God. So what Brother Glenn read there earlier, we need to take heed to those things. And, and I gave him some verses to read, and he came and said, Are you sure you don't want to talk to this verse? I said, Brother, read whatever you want to read. <laughs> Just read. So I tell him to read the whole chapter, but... But I know he didn't really want to do that. But listen again to what it says. And start with verse 16. So, so you will be delivered from the, the forbidden woman. 
from the adulteress and from her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her past to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the past of life. So you will walk in the way of good and keep the past of the righteous. For the upright will inherit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. See, we have to understand who is the one that knows best. You know that, that old TV program, Father Knows Best. <laughs> well, let me, let me re, re, retitle that. The Father Knows Best. Amen. God Knows Best. And we need to look at his word and, and we need to follow his standard of how we're supposed to live, the path in which we're supposed to walk down, the path in which we're supposed to take, and, and not turn around when we, we think that things are, are getting a little thick here. I, I think I'm going in the wrong direction. Keep going. Keep going and endure it all, and you'll find that you are going in the right direction because it is God's way. He's the one that leads us. All you have to do is just, just look for that flicker of light and, and, and walk toward it. And you'll find yourself on the right path, doing the right thing, because this, again, is what God desires of us. Godly families. Parents fear God and teach his word. You know, why do we say the things in which we say? Why do we teach the things in which we teach? Because we know that we will be held accountable for those things. I mentioned the other day from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 where it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. See, this is a command to the father, something that a father needs to do. We, we find where, where Paul talks to Timothy and, and tells him that he had known the scriptures from his youth up. His grandmother and his mother taught him the scriptures that he may know how he should live his life. Their children, they teach their children to fear God. And when a child listens to the instructions of his parents or her parents, and they go to the word of God and they see what, what God has directed for the child to do, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. It's the first commandment with promise, but that you may live long on the earth. It's the first commandment with promise. A, a commandment that, that was given to the children of Israel. And, and then we find that it is for children even today that they should honor their mother and their father and listen to them. How long will one be your parent until that parent is no longer? Amen. No longer. I talk to my mom, you know, just about every day. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I honor her. She, she asked me to do something. As long as it's according to God's will, I'll do those things. But if it's not, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and nine times out of ten, she's not going to ask me to do anything that, that she knows that I am not going to do. Amen. Because of who I am, because of who God is. And we need to understand that, that we honor our parents because that's is who they are. They are our parents. They're the one that brought us into this world. Yeah, we know that God has power over life and death, but we fear those parents sometimes because of what they will put on us or what they did put on us. We respect them for who they are, for how they raised us. But we look at the word of God and we have to understand that we need to, you know, give him praise, give him honor, find awe in him because he is our God. And we are going to have to give an account to him because of who he is. Man. Do you fear him? Do, do, you, do you honor him? But Glenn, do you have Jonah 1-9? You get that, read it for us, please. Jonah 1 9. Jonah 1 9. And he said to them, 
I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. You know, Jonah knew exactly who he was before God. He heard what God wanted him to do, but yet he went in a different direction in which God had bidden him to go. And here he says, I fear God. Well, if you fear him, why did you not, why did you not do what he told you to do in the first place? Why, why have you brought this up upon us, you know? And he said, look, you just go ahead and cast me overboard and, and, and everything will be all right for you. And what did they do? Did they, 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 at first they wanted to, we can save you, Jonah, as we save ourselves, but it wasn't going to be possible. So therefore they listened to him and the seas were calm. But Jonah, the Bible says, feared God, feared him. And, and yes, we know in the end that what God wanted Jonah to do, that God did not change those things. Those things still need to take place. Now you go, after he had been swallowed by that great fish, and, and God allowed that fish to, to, to vomit him up on dry land, and, and there God comes back to him and tells him what he wanted him to do. You go and you preach to Nineveh. The words did not change. The message did not change. And what did Jonah do? Jonah went and did exactly what God bid him to do. Amen. And so we have to understand what fear in God is all about. And then when we look at being afraid of displeasing there in 1 Samuel chapter 11 and then the verse is 7. We, we, we look at these individuals here because these individuals at, at one time, you know, looked at what God wanted them to do and, and then some said, yeah, I'm going to do those things. Others said, yeah, I have done those things. But yet sometimes we find that people are not really who they say they are because of their actions. First Samuel 11 and the verse is 7. 11 and 7. He, he took a, a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and, and sent them down throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messenger saying, whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to this oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people and they came out as one man. <clears throat> you know, when we go back and we look at, at, at the, the, the battles that, that were fought the things that were done, and we see that, that God is with those individuals. And it goes back and says, was everything done exactly the way God wanted it to be done? You know, here, here we're talking about Saul defeating the Amorites here. Was, was it all according to his will? What Was everything done exactly like that? And we know if we continue to read and we look at uh, Saul and his actions that Saul fell short. But a lot of times we go back and look at the beginning of these individuals and we say they were afraid of displeasing God because of the fear that they had for God and they understood the power of God and knew that he was God because he the one that created all things. What does it mean to be godly? That's a question that, that we need to ask ourselves. What does it mean to be godly? That, that you're keeping his word. You're doing what he says in 2 John 1, 6. How many of us are godly today? And it is not by what we say, but it's about what we do, that we're found to be godly. 2 John 1, 6. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandments, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Do we walk in it? To do what God says. Don't question him. He say you do. We do. And it's simple as that, isn't it? No, we want an answer. Well, we want to know why. Again, because he's God. And he will always be God. 
Amen. And we need to dedicate our lives unto him. As we know, we say that we're part of the family of God. We've been adopted into this family. And so we need to be dedicated to the family. Amen. Dedicated. In Matthew 22, starting with verse 34, what, what is this dedication all about? But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what yields the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Can, can you hear? Oh, I got him now. No, he did not have him. Because Jesus went a little bit further. Amen. You ask what's the greatest, and I told you what the greatest. He said, and, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. On these two, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So we have to look at that. We have to ask ourselves, how do we love God? Are we dedicated to him? Do we love him with, with all uh, of our, our souls, with all of our hearts, with all of our minds? Do we love him? He says, if, if you love God like that, he said, the second is like unto you, love your neighbor as yourself. You, you go back and you look at the commandments and what the commandments said for you not to do this, you not to do that, you, you ought to do this, and you look at those things and you say, oh, yes, it, it's very clear now. If I love God, I'm going to love my neighbor. And I'm going to do the things that's right. If I love God, I'm going to love my parents. And I'm going to do the things that's right. I'm going to keep his word. Now, I know I'm not telling anybody in here to go back and say, you know, oh, Brother Melvin said we're to keep the Ten Commandments. No, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that you're supposed to love God. Amen. That's what godly families do. They love God. They look at the word and they know what word is for them and what word was for them. And they do the things that are right. See, the parents are supposed to do certain things. The mother has her role, the father has her role, and then children have their roles. And if everybody performed their role, you think how good this world would be. We, we say, and when we look at all the things that are happening on the news, and we say, you know, there are some children that are running wild, some children that have had no direction. And that's not always the case. Yeah, the children are running wild, but it's not because they had no direction, it's because they Stop doing what was right. See, we can't stop doing what's right. We have to look at what God's word says, and we have to be dedicated to the cause. Who twisted your arm to become a child of God? Again, we're adopted into the family. But we put ourselves up for adoption, and we volunteer to become a family of God by doing the things that were right and pleasing before him. So again, we go back to, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, where it talks about teaching our children, teaching our children the right things to do in the right way to do them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, that you may live long on the earth, for this is the first commandment with a promise. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we teach our children to fear God. We teach our children to follow what is right, the path that is right. And as parents, we, we, we don't want to provoke them, but we want to continue to teach them. And, and we have to understand within the teaching, there are some times that we're going to have to do some things that, that the child may not be pleased with, but God is pleased with it. And that part is called discipline. We have to discipline our children because God disciplined us. He disciplines those or he chastens those that he loves. Yeah, there are many ways that we discipline our children. You know, I, I, I go back to, to, to the old way. And I look at what my parents and what my grandparents, what they did unto me to get me back in line. And I, and I, and I, I picked up on those things. And I, and I go to the word of God and I see what the word of God says. And I say, there's nothing wrong with that. But society has said, there is something wrong with it. You cannot discipline your child like that. That's why the jailhouses are full. 
because you can't discipline your children like that. Amen. That, that's why the jailhouses are full, because we have parents that have gotten away from God's word, and they have started listening to society, and they do those things that society is pleased with, but yet they're saying, teach your children. Get control of your children. What are we going to teach our children? We're going to teach our children the word of God, and we're going to do the things that are right and pleasing before him. Godly families respect. They respect. And in, in this respecting, they deny self. They deny self. In Mark chapter 8 and the verse is 34. Mark 8 and the verse is 34. Who do you respect today? See, a lot of times when, when we don't respect self, we will not respect anybody else. And so we have to look at God's word. And again, we have to do the things that are right and pleasing before him. Mark chapter 8 and the verse is 34. In verse, verse 31, Mark, Mark 8, 31, he said, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and, and, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so again, when we look and we say, what does it really mean to deny self? We, we can't accept what man says, but we have to accept what God says. Here Jesus is telling Peter how it is going to be, or telling the people how it's going to be. And Peter said, no way. And Jesus said, yes, way. Yes, get thee hence. Get behind me, Satan. For, for you're setting your mind on the things of, uh, uh, you're not setting your mind on things of God, but the things of, the, of man. Just because man said it doesn't make it right. We have to look at what God has said and do those things. And he even tells us how, how to treat others in this respect aspect. He tells us how to treat us. We've already read that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our minds. And, and, and what the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. How to treat others. Jesus tells us those things. Are we willing to accept them as being truth? Or are we willing to, to put these things into place to say that we are children of God and, and I respect not just you know who I am, but I respect who he is and I, I respect his word and I'm going to follow his word. So what does he tell us here in Matthew chapter 7 and the verse is 12? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Treatment of others. What, what, what do you want to happen to you? He says, you do it to someone else. And, and that, that, that same thing can happen to you. You want a handout? Give a handout. You, you, you want you know, good things to happen to you? You do good things to others. So we have to know. That God is not a respected person. This, this is the golden rule. You know, I've seen this hanging, you know, on, on, a, on a, uh, one of those clay things on my grandmother's wall. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. The golden rule. The golden rule. See, we've always been taught this. It comes from God's word, doesn't it? So therefore, we need to say, this is how I need to treat others. Do unto them as you would have them do unto you. Kind and gentle. Kind and gentle. What does it mean to be kind and gentle? You know, we have to, again, we go right to the word of God. We don't want to go outside it to, to figure out what this means. We go right to his word. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, the verses 6. But this is why the gospel is preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh, the way of the the way the people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Hmm. Are we willing to take time to, to teach someone the right way? To show them, according to God's word, what they need to do? See, there is a new life for, for each one of us. Some of us have already ventured off into it. Some others are, are contemplating whether or not they want to put on Christ in order to live this new life because of, of what they need to do. Again, we go to the Word of God and we show them what needs to take place. Colossians chapter 3 
And let's just start with verse 5, Colossians 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. Respect. So we respect one another by telling them what they need to do. And, and a lot of times they tell us, oh, you used to. You used to be like that. You used to do those things. Not going to deny it. True enough, we have done wrong because the Bible tells us we have. Amen. Amen. You too once walked like that. Amen. You, you used to live like that, but not any longer. Amen. You are now a child of God. And so we share with people, our families, you know. How many of us have, have always been a child of God? How, how many of us in here have never done anything wrong? If you've never done anything wrong, never done anything wrong whatsoever, y'all know the rest, right? <laughs> Get up and leave. Yeah. I see no one jumping up. The, the, the door is still wide open. It, it's open. Go ahead. Leave. You have you have permission to get up and leave, but I want you to know there's only one perfect person that has walked this earth, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. He's Amen. no longer here on this earth. He, he's at the right hand of the Father. <coughs> but we, we have done wrong, but we don't have to do wrong. Love. Love. How, 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 do we really understand what love is all about? Love is teaching the truth. Love is sharing with others. Here in Titus chapter 2, we start with verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and Children, training. You train people to do right because you love them. Older men are teaching the younger men and older women are teaching the younger women. That's the way it's supposed to be. That, that comes from God's word. But what do we find? We find a lot of times older men want to be like the young men. Older women want to be like the young women. And all that is causing to happen is confusion. If you're, t if you're a teacher, teach. You, you do what's right before God. The older men, those godly men, are to teach the younger men. Amen. Those older ladies, those older women, those godly women, are to teach the younger to love as they have been loved. Love the way God has loved and teach those things so that people may know what they're supposed to do. Godly families communicate. They talk to one another. Communication is the key to all things. We always say that. If you don't ever tell anybody how you feel, they're never going to know how you feel. You go into the doctor's office or you're laying in a doctor in the hospital bed and they have that little a little picture up there that says, between this picture and that picture, you know, what is your pain? A lot of times you don't say anything, you just, you know, hold up your finger. I don't know. You know, whatever your pain is. Is it one? Hold up one finger. If it's two, two, and it progresses on. But if you never ever talk to someone, they will never know. What do they say? A closed mouth does not get fed. So therefore, we want to make a whole lot of noise. Because we want to get fed. We want to get fed the right things because we want to be the right people. And as you look through Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6, it tells us how to live. It tells us how to walk. It tells us how to look at God and say, this is my father. It tells us to look at Jesus and say, this is my brother. It tells us to look at the word and say, this is my direction. It tells us what to do. As wives, as husbands, it tells us what to do. As children, it tells us what to do. And in order to do all those things, we jump right to the end because of this communication that we have with one another. Don't want to skip how we're supposed to behave ourselves on our jobs, 
But again, it's all because of communication. We look at the end of Ephesians chapter 6 and we see from verse 10 going down to verse 20, it tells us what we need to do in order to endure in talking to one another. See, I, I can't come to you and talk to you if I'm not prepared to handle what you have to say back to me. So therefore, before I come to you, I put the whole armor of God on in order that I may be able to, to say what is right and if you want to fire back at me with things that are wrong, that I may be able to have those things deflected away from me, that I may continue to live the way God wants me to live Amen. and do the things that are right. So take time and read chapter 5 and chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians to see how we're supposed to talk to one another, how, how we're supposed to communicate with one another, how we're supposed to submit to one another as children of God. Listening. This, this is the problem with, 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 with a lot of us. You know, it's always been said, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And a lot of times we want to ignore that and we say, I got about 15 ears. No, not really. I have 15 mouths and only have one ear. I really don't want to hear what you have to say, but I want you to hear everything that I have to say. No, it's give and take. It's give and take. He says something here very important. Let us listen to it in James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Think before you speak. Listen very carefully to what is being said. Communication again is the key. But a lot of times we have to allow that communication to be done by the next party. And we take all of those things in. And as you're taking those things in, you decipher what, 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 what needs to be deciphered. You get rid of what needs to be get rid of, and you hold on to what needs to be hold on, held on to. Again, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not profit to produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampart wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So listening is a good thing. And being calm. Being calm. Again, these, these are things that we have problems with. Things that we need to work on. And, and, and how long should you work on them? Don't take too long. Work on them quickly. Get them out of the way so that you can move on and that you can work on something else. He says in Proverbs 29, 22, a man of wrath stirs up strife and, and one given to anger causes much transgression. And so we need to be calm. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to work up strife. We need to be calm in, in the things in which we do patient with one another. That, that's, a, that's a problem that we have. And then we go to Philippians chapter 4 verse 2 and we, we find that we need to be reasonable. We don't ask anybody to do anything out of their control. We need to be reasonable with, with what we say to people, what we're asking of people. Reasonable. Is, is that too much to ask for, for one to be reasonable? I don't think so. I think that it is, it is possible Philippians 4, let's just start with verse 1. It says, Therefore, bro my, my brothers, whom I love and long for, for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Judea and entreat Asenthus to ag agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. Well, what does that mean, to agree in the Lord? Can, can two walk together unless they agree? When, when he tells us to agree in the Lord, what does it mean? That we look at God's word and we see what we need to do. Again, reasonable. God would not ask us to do anything that he would not do himself. Is that not reasonable enough? He, he, he told Abraham, you go and you, you sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac. Why did God tell him to do that? Because God knew what he was going to do later. And he did that. 
He told Abraham, no, don't, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. There was a ram in the bush. But God himself sent his son to die for the sins of the world, allowed him to be crucified on the cross of Calvary because he loves us. Again, reasonable. Agree in the Lord about what needs to be done, what needs to be said. Agree in the Lord. You know, again, this is not asking too much, is it? To sit down with someone and to talk to them and do things according to the word of God. Again, people don't like for you to say, okay, let's just open up the word of God. Let's see what God says about the matter. This is our instruction book. This is our guide book. This is our how-to book. The Bible is God's way. Amen. Amen. It is God's way. Are you willing today to accept it as God's way? Amen. Willing to accept that it is his way or the way that you're trying to do it is the wrong way? Are you willing to accept that? Again, he, he tells us what we need to do in order to be pleasing to him. Are we willing to do those things? Are you willing to be a part of the family and stay part of the family? I, I've, I've heard too many times people saying, you know, I'm going to take him out of my will. He, he, ha he, he hasn't done what I asked him to do. He, he doesn't love me. He hasn't come by the seat. I'm going to take him out of my will. I knew a lady who, who had her will written out, and then she said, you know, I'm too old to write my will out. I'm going to have my will recorded, and I'm taking him out of it. You know what she did? She had her will recorded and she took him out of it. Why? Because he did not do what she wanted him mm -hmm. to do. You know, God, he doesn't take us out of his will. We take ourselves out of the will. Amen. We remove ourselves. We, we denounce the, the inheritance because we do not want to be the godly people that we have been called to be. We do it to ourselves. So if you want a, a part of the inheritance, the inheritance that God, you know, has for us, prepared for us, that inheritance that's in heaven, you do what's right and you will receive that inheritance, a blessed inheritance, an inheritance that will never be taken away. Or are you going to be there when that, when that will is read? Or are you going to be there when that inheritance is, is issued out? Or are you going to get your share? A lot of people are going to have their part in the lake with burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? I, I don't want that part. That, that's not my part. Amen. The Bible tells us that hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. You know, Amen. I'm no re relationship to the devil. His angels, I, I don't have a guardian angel looking over me. And trust me, Satan's angels are not guardians. So we need to do what's right. That's right. We need to be pleasing unto God. We need to be part of the family of God, this godly family. We need to act the way God wants us to act and do the thing that he wants us to do because that's the only way that we're going to be able to get to heaven. If you're here this evening and you're not a child of God and you want to become one, that opportunity is yours to come and to make that confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, been immersed in the watery grave of baptism, added to the body by the Lord himself. Praising God in heaven, pray with all the people the Lord asks to the church daily, such as should be saved to his family. Not man's, but his family. We, we are a part of a physical family down up on this earth, but we need to become a part of a spiritual family Amen. where we can receive a great inheritance. Amen. And if you're here and you are a part of the family of God, but you have done wrong, do not hesitate to get those things right in order that you may receive what God has in store for you. If you're here in your subject, we ask you to please come as we stand and sing the invitation hymn. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll sing. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be?